Welcome back to another installment of Space This Week, your weekly news recap of all the latest happenings in the world of spaceflight, and we have a lot to cover today. Starship development has seen some big news, from Elon Musk revealing that Starship's fifth flight test will be in just four weeks, and SpaceX all but confirming a tower catch. There's a lot to be excited for. We also saw four orbital launches over the week by JAXA, SpaceX, Firefly, and China, and the simulated return to Earth of NASA's Chappier one, the crew of which spent over a year living aboard a 3D printed simulated Mars habitat in a Texan hangar. All of this and so much more, so sit back and enjoy. Starship Ship 31 conducted another cryoproof test last week. The last time SpaceX attempted a cryo test of this vehicle was back in May, but this resulted in rather shocking events. <laughs> the initial cryo testing at Macy's seemed initially to go very well. However, we then saw a dramatic and sustained flash of light erupting from the ship's fuselage. Unfortunately, due to the fog and distance from the camera, it's pretty hard to pinpoint the exact location of this event, but here's a zoomed in photo of the ship from Starbase Surfer. The electrical arc appears to have burst out from the cable raceway. Not sure what triggered the fault and what specific systems were affected. There's quite a lot more to the ship than just fuel tanks and engines. Lots of electrical systems are required to make Starship work, like the forward and aft flap actuators, flight computers, engine actuators, sensors, and so any or all of these systems might be affected. Luckily, during last week's testing, things appeared to go better. No visible faults could be seen on the live stream views, so hopefully this time things were successful. Another cryoproof test was conducted later on in the week, and and again, things seemed to go smoothly, because after this, the ship was rolled back to the build site on the 6th of July for storage in Mega Bay 2. The second launch tower at Starbase is making good progress. On the 3rd of July, NASA Spaceflight's Starbase Live captured the transportation of the first tower segment to the site of the build, ready for stacking. It'll be good to have another launch and catch tower in operation, so that we have some redundancy if the initial catch tests of Super Heavy aren't 100% successful. And yep, SpaceX have all but confirmed that Flight 5, the next Starship flight, will feature a catch attempt, something that's already been stated by Elon Musk. SpaceX released an amazing edit of Starship's fourth flight test, giving us some never-before-seen views, such as this one of the booster splashing down, and the video ended with an animation of what we could expect to see in Flight 5 i.e. a catch attempt. As for watching the tower catch itself, provided nothing goes wrong, we should get some excellent views of the moment. For starters, I would hope that SpaceX keep their drones in the air, you know, the drones that capture these shots of the liftoff, to give us a similar view of the landing taking place. But check this out. Talented 3D artist Jan X posted a cool animation of what the tower catch might look like. I'll link the original post below for you to check out. But another Twitter user, Space Sadua, posted this specific freeze frame as an image post, requesting SpaceX to place a camera on the arms to give us this view during the catch. And Elon replied. A pretty short reply, but nonetheless concise, so we're definitely going to be seeing some spectacular views during the catch, whether the test is a success or not. <laughs> Another thing tweeted by Elon was that SpaceX are aiming for Flight 5 to launch in four weeks, which means an August launch date is on the cards, so mark your calendars for then. Ship 30 is still undergoing replacement of its heat shield, but with SpaceX's cadence, they should hopefully have enough time to get this completed on schedule. We saw the lowering of all the big cranes at Starbase recently because right now, as this video goes up, Starbase is under something of a lockdown as Hurricane Beryl, the first major hurricane of the 2024 season, is actively inland over Texas. The center is already passed east of Boca Chica, so Starbase is safe, but it'll be subjected to high winds and storm surges, so everything that can be lowered, i.e. the cranes, have been lowered, and Booster 12 remains in the Mega Bay. We can likely expect it to be rolled out once the the storm has passed. Which, I guess, is now. As morning broke over Starbase today, we started to see life return to the site with the opening of the Mega Bay 2 door and road closures already expected tomorrow for the presumed rollout of Booster 12. Do humans have what it takes to live on Mars? If we do ever set foot on the red planet, we'll be there for a long time. Unlike jaunts to the moon, getting to and returning from Mars requires a specific transfer window, which means crew will need to spend a long time living on the Martian surface, not to mention the seven to nine month journey to Mars on a relatively small spacecraft. 
Well, NASA has just concluded the first of three missions to see how well we do. On Saturday, the 6th of July, Kelly Haston, Anka Celario, Ross Brockwell and Nathan Jones egressed from a 3D printed simulated Mars habitat, where they've been living in isolation for the past 378 days, performing simulated Mars mission operations, including Mars walks, growing and harvesting vegetables to supplement their non-perishable food, maintaining equipment and the habitat itself, and all of this operating under additional stresses a Mars crew will experience, including up to 22 minute communication delays with Earth, simulated equipment failures, resource limitations, and of course the isolation. The ultimate goal here is to see how human health and performance is affected when subjected to living under the conditions that a Mars mission would impose. Interestingly, Europe and Russia conducted a similar series of experiments between 2007 and 2011, conducting three similar missions aboard a simulated Mars habitat, see this picture here, the final test of which lasted 520 days to simulate a full-length crewed mission, and it included a simulated Mars landing and three Mars walks. It ended with the crew all reportedly in optimal physical and psychological condition. I think I'd personally struggle with such confinement levels myself. How well do you think you would cope? Let me know in the comments below. Imagine a Falcon 9 launching from Mars. Never gonna happen, obviously, but if it did, it would probably look like this. This was the Enrol 186 launch on the 29th of June, and SpaceX have recently shared this new tracking footage of the rocket piercing through the red skies at Vandenberg. This launch wasn't last week though, so let's talk about Falcon 9 launch that was. On the 3rd of July, under the cover of darkness, a Falcon 9 launched from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral, carrying 20 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit, which included 13 satellites with direct-to-cell capability as in, no ground dish required, you can connect to them with just your phone. The first stage completed its 16th overall landing, touching down on the short fall of Gravitas drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. In addition to SpaceX, we also saw Firefly Aerospace launch. This was the fifth launch of their Firefly Alpha rocket, which carried eight CubeSats as part of NASA's CubeSat launch initiatives, Alana 43, which stands for Educational Launch of Nanosatellites, 43. <laughs> the launch was initially attempted on the 2nd of July, but this was aborted on the pad on the first and second attempt, so it was rescheduled to the 4th of July. And this time, result! The rocket successfully lifted off from the Firefly SLC-2 launch pad at Vandenberg Space Force Base, and all eight CubeSats successfully made it to orbit. We also saw a successful launch from China on the same day. A Long March 6A rocket carried the second Tianhu-5 mission to low Earth orbit from the Tai and launch center. The payload was formed of two Earth observation satellites, designated Tianhu 52A and 52B, and official sources have stated that the duo have entered their planned orbits and will be used for geographic mapping, land resource surveys, scientific experiments, and other purposes. China also saw success on board its space station last week, as the Shenzhou 18 crew conducted their second successful spacewalk on the 3rd of July, which was conducted by Taikonauts Guan Fu Yi and Kong Li, working on the station exterior for around six and a half hours, installing various hardware items and performing inspections for space debris damages. Now in last week's episode of Space This Week, I covered the maiden operational flight of Japan's H3 rocket, so now I'm in an awkward spot about whether I should cover it again, considering it did still happen last week. If you want to know more about this one, check out last week's episode, there's a playlist link in the video description. But TLDW, it was a success, and successfully placed the ALOS-4 Synthetic Aperture Radar Satellite in sun-synchronous low Earth orbit. Laun Aerospace headed off to the Red Planet last week, as I set out to showcase some amazing visual upgrades that ksp has received in the form of Black Rack's newly released deferred rendering mod, as well as stock volumetric clouds, EVE, TUFX, Restock, Parallax, and Scatterer, and in addition to being a visual mod showcase, I think the mission itself turned out really nicely, and a fun old time was had by all, so check it out by clicking the card on screen if you haven't seen it yet. But that's it for today's episode of Space This Week. If you want to support the show, then you can join my channel's member page or my Patreon, links below. But yeah, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.